So uh, wel welcome to my talk, um, Regenerate Your Mind. Um, and what I'm going to take you on without spending the whole time in tears is my uh, whole journey uh, of why I'm probably stood here today talking to you about what happened to me. And hopefully, with a bit of luck, we can all actually learn a few lessons, hopefully inspire a little bit to do something, make a bit of a change, and just see sort of the angle I'm coming from when I talk to people, but also why our farm is driven in the way we drive our farm. So I've got to talk a little bit about and give you a brief history of me. And this is very brief. Um, this is our farm today, a little bit different than most. Um, now, now, 1938, um, the, the photograph, um, it's changed very little. Um, it, it's really interesting that I think a lot of farms and farm buildings are actually still standing in 1938, but the way everything's changed and the way everything has developed on farms is quite remarkable. But it wasn't that long ago that we were actually playing with horses, playing with small tractors and that sort of thing. And when you go and see what we're doing now, things have changed rather quite rapidly. I was born in 1976. Um, so for those that are older than me will remind me continuously it was a hot summer, yeah? That's all I ever get told, 1976, yeah, hot summer. I was born on July the 18th, so it was a very hot summer. Um, and of course, um, being a hot summer, we made the worst hay you could possibly make. And on July the 19th, our uh, hay barn went up in flames because my father got a bit keen and how, how he made his hay it was two days too early. So they called me lucky in the farm. I cut an awful lot of my upbringing, but basically my father really encouraged me not to farm. Um, he thought it was quite a lonely profession. He said there was no money to be made. It was, um, it was all going the wrong way. And in actual fact, son, go and, um, go and earn a fortune somewhere else in the bright lights. Um, and that's essentially, um, I thought he was joking. So when I finished university, I really expected him to say, you know, um, yeah, welcome back to the farm. But he threw me a pile of farmer's weeklies and said, go and get a job. So I, uh, I fortunately became a job as, a, as an agronomist, um, and um, I was working mainly in Oxfordshire, um, Bedfordshire, Northamptonshire borders, that sort of place, um, and having um, what I thought was a really good job, and I was really helping farmers do exactly what farmers did, and that was growing an awful lot of yield. And things were rather quite useful, and um, everything was growing rather quite swimmingly in life. And of course, I was going to Barbados on holidays and doing things, and I had time off and that, and couldn't understand why my farmers could only afford to go to Cornwall. Um, but there we are. This, of course, is a picture of me just about to get on the Rocky Mountaineer train in Canada because I charged farmers enough money for me to go and, and, and um, really enjoy my holidays. I had a family. Helen, my wife, lover, has been uh, with me, rather than me be with her, for 30 years now. Um, we, were school, school, uh, we met at school and, and been together ever since. Um, for those that have come and had a look around our farm, I think we can all agree Helen's pretty awesome. Um, Helen, Helen is, um, we're going to talk a bit about Helen because it, it needs talking about. But we were very fortunate. We had our daughter, eldest daughter, Tegan, middle daughter, Erin, and um, young, young boy here, Job. Uh, and um, this was um, pretty much living the dream. And we were having a really good time. Things can change rather quick, pretty quick. This was a photograph I took on. It wasn't the 30th of September because for the first five days I couldn't actually go into the room that my son was lying in fighting for his life. He'd been kicked in the head by a horse. It was just something we, it, it was just one of those things that just flashed up. It was a Friday evening and it was rather quite, um, we were just literally loading some horse poles up into, a, into the back of the truck. Job was strapped in. We used to call him Houdini. He'd undone his straps, got out of the truck, walked across. Horse was there, flashed out. The power of the kick actually smashed his collar here, but actually smashed it this side too. Uh, it was rather quite dreadful. Um, he was airlifted to Birmingham Children's Hospital, which is where we spent the next eight months um, while he was in a coma. Uh, he, he was given a 5% chance of survival, uh, brain damage of about 62%, uh, and, th and things were um, rather quite worrying. Um, it was quite remarkable at that time that how determined you are that in actual fact the positive energy and things like that of making sure your son wasn't going to die, we felt like we were almost filling him with all the positive of me and Helen and almost fighting for his life too. 
it sounds a bit strange, but unless you're in that position, it's really hard to explain. But it, it, remarkably, all of a sudden, Job started coming back online. Things started happening. The doctors couldn't believe what was happening. We were, we were prepared. We were taken to the little room, as we used to call it, time and time again to say, tonight, unfortunately, he's going to not, not make it. That's pretty harsh. Um, and as, as things started coming back online for Job, uh, we were taken to that little room once more and expected to have this little room tell us good news. But in actual fact, we were told, unfortunately, his quality of life would be so poor that, unfortunately, we were going to have to turn the life support off. Anyway, of course, Job defied all the odds, and um, Job actually survived and came home, um, of which we were thrilled. This is a picture of me um, looking rather quite happy. But, it, but between 2013 and 15, um, I, I had massive problems. Um, the adrenaline of actually praying for my son to live um, had pretty much dried up and I was, I was really struggling really struggling I couldn't come to terms um, with the fact I had a disabled child I don't know why I just couldn't come to terms with the fact that this is what I had and I, I was in a really poor place I couldn't actually leave my family. I wanted, I felt I had to protect them at all times. And I couldn't go to work. I wouldn't leave them. It, I found it a real struggle. And I was getting into more and more of a, a depressive state. The other thing I started realizing was when I spent all that time praying for him to live, and I took a bit of a stock of my own life and, and realized I killed things for a living and a hobby. I, I, I used to love shooting. Um, and as an agronomist, I think I focused mainly on killing disease, pests, and weeds. Um, and in actual fact, this whole thing revolved around death. So why was it that I was blessed that Job actually made it through? And these were these, these thought processes that kept going through my head continuously. Helen fortunately stood by me through all of this. Um, and as I said, I, I really wasn't a very nice person. I, I was aggressive. And I think the people that you are closest to, unfortunately, are the people that get affected far more. Um, why she stood by me, I've no idea. But thankfully, I'm stood here today. Not crying, I promise you. <laughs> but she stood by me. Helen actually, in the end, said, you, 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 um, you really need to um, get, get yourself together. We had a really heart-to-heart -heart conversation, and I applied for a Nuffield scholarship. Uh, I didn't want a Nuffield scholarship, I'll be honest. And I was awarded a Nuffield scholarship, and I still didn't want it. And then I realized I had to travel the world, and I didn't want to go. Um, so it was a quite, a, quite a strange thing. But I remember si sitting in Minot Airport in North Dakota... Um, on my own in a car and I bought a six way ticket to the US and it was really one of those crossroads moments in life where I thought I can spend the next six weeks wishing and hoping I was going to um, wish I was at home or I could spend six weeks and turn this into a, into a life changing opportunity very fortunate for me I, I, I ran into an awful lot of people that made me think totally and utterly different about the way I thought about agriculture the way I thought about my life and the way I thought about everything else I came back um, looking very smart, doing my Nuffield presentation. Um, my main conclusion from my whole Nuffield travels is quite pathetic, but in actual fact, I saw this at the Metropolitan University when I went up there and did an interview, and I thought this pretty much summed up my whole, my whole Nuffield, question everything. And something I've, I've started to do, and I do more and more, and I ask everybody all the time, why are you doing this? Why, why, why? Please just tell me why you're doing something. Ask yourself why you're doing something. And if it doesn't make sense, I used to ask my 10-year-old daughter, unfortunately she's growing up now, but they, they, they were brilliant because they were like, why are you doing that, Dad? And I don't know, we've always done it like this, and it's like, uh, it's just amazing. Children are, are awesome. So that changed that. Um, unfortunately, uh, my mental health was on the mend. Um, and then we ended up with a, um, the realisation Job was going to need some care for the rest of his life, um, which was rather quite important that he had this care. So essentially what we did, we, we pursued our public liability. Um, we were insured with the NFU, who have been unbelievably amazing. Uh, but but cut a very long story short, our public liability covers us for 10 million, as I'm sure most of you guys have. Um, Job's claim came in at 17 and a half, which meant me and Helen were liable for 7 and a half million. So we had a bit of a bill. Um, fortunately, we've been fighting this in the high court, and, and there is going to be a happy ending to this um, because we've got the child court of protection come in and basically said you cannot persecute a family for the benefit of one child. So the new case law is coming out and it's going to be called, uh, named after Job, that actually 
looking after his family, looking after him, it's really important that we all remain together. But the bank, for obvious reasons, got whiff of the fact we were being sued for seven and a half million and decided that actually, if we were forced to sell overnight, um, we'd probably only realize um, exactly what we owed, um, and therefore they were going to lose out. So essentially, they um, decided that um, perhaps it was a good idea that we, um, we didn't borrow any money off them. So all of a sudden, I had to farm for free. And for anybody that's tried to farm for free, it's quite hard. So what we started looking at is how to innovate. I made all these contacts back with everybody I'd met from around the world of my left field travels. How can I do this? And it was absolutely remarkable, the, the, the help I received. You know, I've, I've just put a few photographs up here of roots, of understanding how roots work. The fact that if you look at our, the way we apply nitrogen and you compare that nitrogen to the root of a bean crop, funny enough, they mimic each other quite, quite well. So in actual fact, I started looking at nature and it, starting to understand and read, and I've read 700-odd books. I, I'm a little bit strange like that. Um, and, and just learned, in actual fact, um, the way we farm is not the way we should farm. And in actual fact, you can change the way we farm. So in actual fact, as I always say, desperation generally leads to innovation, and it's a really good thing, uh, and certainly a good thing for me. This is taken from Canada, but I think it's really quite important that we, that we have a look, and it, it's very different from the U, uh, and not different from the UK at all, in, in so much as, let's be honest, you know, turnover is, is vanity, and that's it also increasing, but if we look at our, our profits on farm, of course, the sanity really is, in actual fact, we just seem to be turning over bigger and bigger numbers for very little extra income. So in actual fact, who on earth is making these profits out of the farm? It's generally not the farmer. So it's time to actually, for me and for you guys, and really importantly, is actually who owns your farm? I have a chapter in the book I'm writing at the moment, and it's all about who owns your farm. Take the ownership back. You are a farmer. One really important part for me is the fact that we are problem solvers. We are no good with recipes. We are incredibly smart people that can, can look at problems and solve them. And I think one of the biggest mental health issues from farmers at the moment is you are given prescriptions and you're not using your brain to innovate. So for me, in actual fact, when you look at a problem, rather than take a recipe straight away or a plan or something, challenge yourself why you have it in the first place. Is there a way you can do it? And believe me, you get a huge buzz out of, out of changing the thought process and actually starting to use the brain you were born with. And I use the, the, the term moron, because uh, as far as I'm concerned, we're all, all very much guilty of this. We put more and more and more on. We don't generally seem to be getting any higher yields, and we certainly don't seem to be ending more, making more and more profit. Therefore, if we can't influence that end of the whole part of farming, let's have a look at the input side. And as you can see, it's rather quite drastic. I'm going to briefly, but very briefly, just talk about the fact that I then became a bit of a, a, from agronomist. I decided, in actual fact, perhaps the way forward was to, um, to become a, um, an independent consultant. It's quite hard, in actual fact, especially when you've still got some mental health issues. You know, can you actually break the shackles of employment? It sounds ridiculous to all us as farmers that employ people, but believe it or not, actually, when you're employed, it's very, very hard. You're trapped. You know, can I pay the mortgage? Will people actually value my advice? And that sort of thing. And that was a real, real challenge for me. So what, what could we do? In the end, I had enough people that said, for goodness sake, just do it, <laughs> and we will support you. And, I, and, and um, I had some amazing clients that just said, you know what, Ben? We, we firmly believe in what you're talking about, and we firmly believe in what you do. You, you're, you're a clever bloke, you know, so, so, so do what you do. Interesting enough, um, it's gone rather well, and I'm really quite thrilled. So thank you to everybody that's in this audience that has heard this story a thousand times. And believe me, you're all here today, and I know you're here watching me, and it's purely for the fact you're here to support, and that really, really means a lot. So mental health in farming is, is something that um, is, is, is starting, thankfully, to become really quite important. And one, one statistic I'll just pull out is the amount of suicides that happen on farm. Every three days, somebody, unfortunately, on farms takes their life. And there's some great charities doing some great work out there, and I think it's really important um, that they're doing all this sort of thing. But going back to my Nuffield conclusion, why? And more to the point, in actual fact, can agriculture be a solution for mental health rather than in actual fact causing the mental health? 
And for me, I, I, I often turn things on its head, and I believe firmly that agriculture can be a cure for mental health. If we start changing the way and start invigorating the way our farms work and our businesses work and the people we employ or the people we actually work with. It is well known nature is one of the most amazing things for mental health. I do a farm walk, and I tell you, if you ever want to make some money really quickly out of nothing, yeah? I do a walk, four o'clock every Saturday morning through the summer months. We start in June. We go right the way through September. And we call it the Sounds of the Silence Walk. So everybody turns up, and it's generally charged 40 pounds, and we walk around the farm in absolute silence, and then they get in their cars and leave. And sometimes what we take for granted as farmers every single day, and you don't think it's very special to an awful lot of people, it's very, very healing, and we call it sound healing, and all these buzzwords are coming out now. And I think some of the things we take massively for granted is, is what actually can help the general public. So for me, these sort of things are really important. It sounds ridiculous, and like you say, we all have a laugh about it, but in actual fact, the, the reviews, you can have a look at my Google reviews on the Sounds of the Silence Walk, it's, it's five-star every time. I haven't spoke to them. Um, and, and, and with, with a caveat as well is that um, for those that are really interested in birds and birdsong um, I don't get the fact that why are we looking for a grasshopper warbler rather than actually listen to a blackbird we might have an abundance of blackbirds they're beautiful in song so in actual fact enjoy that rather than this uniqueness so for me that's why I, I, I ask people just to listen to everything that's around you the NHS spends an awful lot of money on mental health. And I think in England alone, it's 14, nearly 15% of its budget, of which it comes to, I don't know, the writing's too small, but it's an awful lot of money. <laughs> agriculture, we get 1.4 billion in, in agricultural subsidies in England. And I'll challenge the fact that perhaps we need to think a little bit differently about our farms and the way we spend our subsidies and as far as I'm concerned, actually, our subsidies could be a really big part of the NHS budget. So I'd challenge anybody, in actual fact, if we're going to cause that this could be part of, the pro uh, part of the solution, you know, let's call the NHS the Natural Health Service and actually start working with the NHS as farmers and providing the opportunity for people to cure themselves, take them into nature and, and do exactly that. So I think rather quite importantly... We need to just change the way we believe our subsidies are paid and rather look at them as benefits. In actual fact, we can offer services and really important services of that. The other thing I think we all really understand is the fact that talking to people is probably the most important part of farming and so, so, sorting your mental health problems out. This is a photograph taken in 1938 of our farm supporting 17 families. Things have somewhat changed. And believe it or not, I believe this is a big part of why we've got mental health problems. There's a lot of lonely farmers out there. There's a lot of people working on their own. I actually firmly believe that people employ agronomists for a chat. It sounds ridiculous, but I really do think it is. Uh, and people actually, every time, I, a, a lot of the time I, I, I work as an agronomist, uh, uh, it was a conversation about the rugby at the weekend. It was a conversation about anything. They weren't really interested in, in, they knew what they were doing pretty much on the crops, but it was actually the only face they'd seen that week. So for me, in actual fact, something we're looking at is actually bringing families back onto the farm. And I'll, I'll talk about that. So I'm going to uh, carry on with... Um, how are we going to try and regenerate everything? One thing about regenerative agriculture, it's not about your soil, it's not about the crops, it's not about the animals, it's not just about nature, it's about everything, society. Okay, so for me, actually, it's all about the whole five principles. So how do we regenerate everything? Number one, human integration. I think that's really important, point number one. Number two, <laughs> remove the passengers. Leeches, as, as some people prefer them to. But we'll call them passengers, shall we? Number three was a real challenge for me to explain what I meant. And I call it intensification of agriculture. 
And as soon as I tell somebody I'm ten intensifying my farm, everyone assumes immediately that I'm using far more chemicals, far more fertilizers, far more tractors, and, and, and far more vets bills, and we're pushing antibiotics into cattle like you couldn't believe. So I've had to try and explain to people that what we're doing is intensifying diversity across our business. But we're doing it rather quite simply. And for those that come and visit the farm, and, and, and when I do a talk or a podcast and everyone goes, it's impossible what you're doing, it, it, you can't do it. And then when people come for a visit, it's not quite as impossible as, you, as, as it sounds because it's hard to actually explain how we manage. How we manage. And I've got a Helen, which helps. Appreciation over depreciation. For two reasons. Number one, machinery, of course, we all assume. Number two, your brain. Appreciate what you do in your head. Don't depreciate what you've got in your head. It's really important, this appreciation, appreciation, appreciation. As farmers, we're all big, brazen, don't need any thanks, don't need anything. Do you know what? When somebody walks through your farm and says, what I think you're doing is awesome, you, you, you grow. It's an amazing feeling. So I will challenge anybody that stands there and says, yeah, no, I don't need any thanks, I don't need any, I'm cool. You know, you're really not. And the other thing we do on the farm is collaboration and empowerment. We do not employ anybody at Townsend, and there's one reason why we don't employ anybody at Townsend. We, we haven't got any money, um, and the bank won't let us have any money. So in actual fact, we had to come up with another reason of, of integrating people, and, 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 um, and that's what we do. And I'm going to talk you through pretty much what we do. This is us joining Storm Units, planting a hedge. It was only 104 miles an hour, but we were having a bit of fun. Because one thing for me is actually putting the fun back into farming is the most important part of it all. If you're not having fun, you're not enjoying it, you're not actually farming well. So for me, it's all about integration of family, as you can see. Um, the girls are loving it. Job is stood up in the Kubota. Yes, and I appreciate that's probably illegal and everything, but we are what we are, okay? And the, and the two girls planting the hedge. Yeah, all I said is this, this is memory creating. One day in 20 years' time, you'll realize and remember, you remember when Dad made us plant this hedge in, that, in, in, in 112 mile an hour winds? Yeah, it's cool. So what do we do? So one of the most important things for me, and I'll just flick through those, use your senses. We spend too many time driving around a farm in a truck or a tractor. How many times do we actually get out of the tractor and truck and walk across the field? pick some of the fresh veg, smell the soil, listen to the environment, all of those things. We were born with five senses for a good reason. I'm now reciting most of the thing. I happened to stay with the, the Amish when I was in America that blew me away and their understanding and their whole understanding of communities and how that acts within agriculture. And essentially they were saying your five senses are the things you should be farming with. So for me, it's really important that we actually start using our five senses again. You know, we're often far too big farming area. So, so we... Don't agree? <laughs> Full support of the other one. The other thing I talk about, family integration. Yeah? What I found I was doing... Yeah, you agree with that too? Cool. I've got one found. Family integration is something that I find quite amazing when I turn up to a, so many farms and everybody tells me they're a family farm. No, you're not. You're a farmer and your family stay in the house. That's not a family farm. Family farm is integration. People getting involved. Take your family with you. Explain to your family what you do. They don't necessarily have to come out on the farm, but at least take them on the journey. When they're talking to people, tell them what you're doing. Get them involved. One of the big things for me, successional planning. Okay, when you get to my age, unfortunately, every surprise I seem to be dealt is not a very good one. You know, as a kid, it's great. It's generally a birthday or Christmas, and it's a lovely surprise. You get to a certain age, and unfortunately, most surprises are pretty awful. So in actual fact, successional meetings, I don't know how many people here have annual succession meetings with the whole family. It can take 20 minutes, but at least when I know things, are, things I disappear, my girls are fully understanding exactly what happens. Prepare people. Shocks are horrible. And unfortunately, I've seen so many families ripped apart because of really poor succession planning. And the worst thing is, for me, the older people get, the less they want to talk about it. So the, the solution to that is actually start talking about it when you're young. So we have a successful planning meeting. 
farmer integration. Don't really need to talk a lot about farmer integration. This is what we're all here for, yeah? I found it amazing yesterday. I went to various lectures um, and possibly didn't learn an awful lot. Not that I know it all, but um, it was just, you know, one of those things. And yet you walk outside and you talk to somebody and they give you that little nugget of information. And it was really amazing last night. I was talking to somebody about free choice minerals and copper and how we found our sheep have been cured from foot rot because we allow sheep to come and have free, free choice of copper. And the lad turns to me and he said that was worth £80 entry fee alone. And you just think this farmer to farmer conversations, you know, let's have more of them. They're brilliant. The beautiful thing about groundswell itself is, is, is the fact we're all farmers and all, all talking a little bit too long in the bar last night. Public integration. This is a side of our, is it still there? Yeah, this is a side of our grain store. We thought we'd actually try and explain to the public what we're doing and the journey we're on. Public are really important people. They eat our food, yeah? We spend most of our time chasing them off our land and then ask them to buy British. I have a problem with this. So what I try and do is engage with the public as much as I possibly can. We put notice boards up everywhere. You can put the smallest notice board up on a footpath, explain what you're doing. The public love it. But they absolutely love the fact you're trying to explain to them why those hedges have been left and they're not all square and boxed like they always used to be um, cut every year. All these sort of little things that we think are obvious, a bit like the sounds of the silent walk, explain to people what you're doing. Really important. We do lots of integration with everybody. Student integration. I think I've, I've been talking to loads of people that are actually working with students, and that's fantastic. Students are desperate to learn. You know, reach out to university and offer the, offer placements. You know, come come and learn, come and learn, and see what we're doing. I think that's really important. You know, there's an awful lot of students at the moment got a real bit of a problem. I'll, I'll be honest, at a lot of universities where they're still being taught, shall I say, conventional ag, and and realise it's probably not the future. So, in actual fact. If we don't offer placements and things like that, unfortunately, we're never going to get people involved. NGOs. Integrate with NGOs. NGOs have generally got huge amounts of cash. That's quite useful, especially if you've got no money. I wanted to do some really cool stuff, and I couldn't afford to do it. So I, I emailed a load of people and said, this is what I want to do. And funny enough, they turned up on the farm. I took them on a farm tour and said that our sticking point on this compost is how I extract it and apply it on a drill. And they said, um, I think we can help you there. And for me, with NGOs, if you don't ask, you won't get. And believe it or not, they're supported by the general public generally, and the general public then get told exactly what you're doing, and it becomes that public education and public awareness thing. So NGOs are a really positive part of my business, and the more you engage with them, the more they engage back, and the more they actually push you to do the next thing and the next thing. Political, goodness me, never thought I'd be saying this. Political integration. In actual fact, if we're going to drive policy change, speak to your MP, invite them to the farm, get them engaging. I live in the Y Valley. Our river is literally a running sewer. We're doing things differently. We're trying not to put any soil in the river. We're not using phosphates. We're using phosphate solubilizing but, um, um, Johnson Sioux extracts all these sort of things to actually prevent pollution. More to the point, I don't particularly want to lose my soil either. I haven't got much of it. Um, for 50-odd for years before, um, we got rid of an awful lot of it. I need to build it, not lose it. And funny enough, when, they, when you invite them, they all turn up. Oh, dear. Okay. I don't need to say a lot here, do I? Yeah? Just identify everybody that's giving you help. Those bills that arrive every month, email, post, really need to start focusing on those bills. Keep asking the question, why? Keep asking the question. Solar panels, I guess some of you guys have got solar panels. Look at the cost of electricity right now. Solar panels in themselves are paying for themselves within three years. And all of a sudden you haven't got another bill for 30 years. It's a pretty awesome thing to do. Identify everybody that is helping. Become obsessed 
with reducing input costs. But I also say do not cut corners, cut costs. Really important that we don't just ridiculously do something on the whim that I'm going to go fertilizer free this year. Congratulations, have you told your soil that's what you're going to expect from them? Probably not. And there's a lot of questions I've always asked this year. How do I go less, less, less? In actual fact, you have to prepare. But if you don't start preparing today, then in actual fact, you're not going to be able to do it next year either. You have to review exactly what you're doing often. Where are the biggest bills coming from and why are they big? And how do I make them smaller? You don't owe anybody a living, only yourselves. I think a very famous, famous talk talks about feeding, feeding the family, not the world. Concentrate on you, concentrate on the family. You're not feeding the world. And to get rid of some, you often have to get rid of some first. Intensify diversity simply. Quite, quite snazzy, isn't it? So this is a picture of our flood um, last year. This year it's grown uh, quite considerably. Um, I'm not a livestock farmer and I never, never confess to be. But there's a few things in livestock farming I don't get either. So um, I was told that you can't put animals together. I was told that pigs don't graze grass. I was told um, goats, you can't keep them in. They were right, you can't. Uh, but I was told an awful lot of rules for agriculture, and, and um, I couldn't really work out um, why. And I spent a lot of time going around grassland farmers farming a lot of sheep, and they seemed to have 20 sheep in every field and spend all day driving field to field to field to check that there wasn't anything on its back or something with its head stuck in a fence and that sort of thing. So I just thought one day, um, in actual fact, uh, I haven't got the time to do all that, but I want livestock. So all we did was get every piece of livestock we had and stick it in one paddock and move them as a mob. And funny enough, they haven't all killed each other. It takes about 15 seconds every day to move our animals. We open a gate and they walk through to the next bit. And if they don't walk past you, there might be something wrong with them, in which case you need to do something about that. I'm not sure, as a livestock farmer, what else I should do during the day. But I don't. I really, you, you know, I, fi I, fi I, find, I find it, we, we, we almost become obsessed with, with running around. Um, as you can see, I don't do a lot of running. <laughs> so, yeah, for me, it, it's really important. I probably talked about all of this and I, I forgot to press the button on the way through. But for me, topping, obsession of British agriculture. Top things to make it look smart. Just burning labour, burning diesel and burning machinery. What we need to do is actually embrace the chaos of nature, put a sign up to the public. The reason I haven't done this is, A, I can't be bothered, and B, we're, we're turning it over to a bit of nature. Wonderful. Comes on, sounds of the silence talk? Yeah. 4 a.m. Saturday morning. Don't say anything. And I, up they come. It's really good. So, yes, it, it's really important for us that actually we look at all this diversity. So that's just the, the, the livestock itself. But look at your crops. How do we stick more diversity into crops? And people are starting to grow field blends of wheat, and that's fantastic. And field blends of wheat are really starting to become really popular. So why aren't you doing that with all seed rape? Why aren't you doing that with peas, beans, oats, and everything else? And why on earth are we not doing it with potatoes? So funnily enough, this year we are. We plant multi multi varieties of potatoes, all in, all in, all in. And funny enough, for those guys, there's some Estonians here, and there's some Oxford inspiring guys there. I think. Um, and on the digs, our, our um, multiple species of potatoes are, are far healthier in, in so much as what they're doing. Challenge the norm. I can't read any of this. It's something about crops and stuff, isn't it? Um, but I've, I've, sp I've spoken mainly about it. But yeah, essentially, it's all about diversity. It's, and become obsessed with diversity. And the other thing I've become obsessed with is, is the wider aspect of diversity business I speak to a lot of farmers arable farmers that just believe that for some reason that farm should pay them a living wage end of story why isn't my farm making me enough money because you're not doing enough work what do you mean 
well, why don't you bring some livestock? I don't want any livestock. Well, that's a wonderful choice you've got. But in actual fact, if you want to make more profitability, actually put, bring another income stream on the farm. The opportunities are all there. We can do an awful lot more. And actually, funny enough, by integrating diversity and bringing livestock in a farm, funny enough, grazing wheat, for instance, helps the tillering, reduces an awful lot of things, turns to uh, um, aphid pressure and that sort of thing. The manure goes back on the farm, uh, back on the field, gives an amazing amount of nitrogen early for that crop growth. So rather than ram a load of ammonium, oh, I'm sorry, I've upset you. <laughs> and rather than stick a load of ammonium nitrate on the soil and kill all the, all the bacteria that are just about to wake up and provide you nitrogen for free, livestock can do that. So yeah, livestock, they're awesome. This is a picture, um, I don't know why I didn't hold the camera still and I'm really sorry for getting seasick like me up here. <laughs> I was actually trying to show that there were swallows and swifts and, and the house martins and, oh dear, I'm, I can't look. <laughs> oh, I can have some water. But interestingly enough, this, this field is next door to a field that's been overgrazed. And what was the most amazing thing on the overgraze, we have rooks, we have pigeons, we have jackdaws. And on the herbal lay, we have swallows, swifts, house martins, all sorts of amazing. And you just think, we've driven, we've driven biodiversity changes. We don't realize it until you open your eyes and start realizing that actually, in actual fact, if you don't allow a crow to land on bare soil, or bare ground, or overgrazed ground, it doesn't like landing in the middle of a herbal lay. We've changed the landscape, and we wonder why. Going back to basics is something really important. Essentially, start looking at biomimicry. Look at the way we grow things. What I always find amazing and when I tell a lot of people is you look at a verge site in the middle of a hot summer and it's as green as grass. It's not as green as my grass. Um, but most people's fields are burnt up, dying. And you go and dig a spade full of soil out of that verge and a spade, spade full of soil out of, out of the fit field and you're within three meters and, and the difference is the fact that biology is working in one and not in the other. I want that to work for me. How do we make it work? There's lots of ways. The point I've just made there as well is um, 500,000 pounds worth of equipment to drill a field of wheat. By the time you spent 250,000 pounds on a tractor, another 250,000 pounds on a drill, this year I'm going to use a Massey 135, pulling a Massey 30 drill. Will that grow 500 times less well than the other? One question I ask a lot of people is, when was the last time you bought a tractor to replace another tractor that has less horsepower? The obsession seems to be bigger and bigger kit. The obsession should be smaller and smaller kit. If your saw is becoming more friable and better working and easier working, surely we should be going the other way. I think that's a really quite important point to make. I remember on, my, on our farm, when our Ford 7810 arrived, first four-wheel drive tractor we had, 95 horsepower, my father nearly sent it back as the size was ridiculous. Why on earth would we need a four-wheel drive, 95 horsepower tractor? And now most tractors that run around, what, 250, 300, you know, even on a three-meter combi power hour, they're, they're 220 horsepower. We used to run them on 70. So something's gone terribly wrong. And funny enough, they use more diesel too. Close the loops is a really important thing. You know, home save your seed. My challenge to people is, oh, we need to buy new seed, more vigor. Yeah, really important. Anybody got black grass? How many times have you actually bought in new, new black grass seeds? That's fairly vi vigorous. If you want something to become vigorous in your environment, select it. Just keep selecting it. Funny enough, it gets more and more vigorous. Especially if you start with 297 varieties and then just keep... Home saving and home saving. Funny enough, you get the ones that absolutely suit where you live and how you and how you live. But what we do, we go and buy a seed that's been grown somewhere else and expect it to make all those associations in our soil. It's an oddity. It's certainly a a, a, an unnatural oddity. Add value. 
lots of people are doing this. Listen to John Paul's yesterday talking very much about this. And this is something we're getting obsessed with at home as well. Why on earth am I selling things as commodities to, to supermarkets? I've got the general public absolutely love every, every time uh, we do something the general public love what we do how, how, how can we get hold of this produce because it's not labeled so in actual fact in actual fact why on earth are we not selling direct to consumer we sell our story we've opened a shop produce for your local markets too transport at the moment is ridiculous and in actual fact our local markets are crying out for local locally produced food that's the very first time we opened a little farm shop we converted a little rice horse trailer in three weeks and thought let's just give it a go um fairly overwhelmed by the response but we do lots more now we have a glamp site we have a brewery, we have a water kefir. Um, I shouldn't be telling you water kefir because it's a nice little secret. And essentially what I find really funny is everybody gets really angry with vegans, yeah? It's really important to get angry with a vegan because, you, you know, they don't eat meat, they don't eat milk, they hate the way we farm and everything. And I just thought, well, in actual fact, what, they've got lots of money to be able to become a vegan. What can't they get? I thought, I know, kefir water. Kefir, you know, we all make it out of milk, so in actual fact, why don't we ferment fruit? So we take waste products, and that's something we, we concentrate on the farm, is always actually, where there's muck, there's brass. So actually, if somebody's going to pick strawberries and sell them to, to, to Morrison's, and yet all the big ones are too, too big, and the small ones are too small, and the overripe ones are no good, they'll give those to me for free. I'll ferment them and sell a bottle of water for £3.50. Funny enough, which is slightly dearer than the margin they're making on a punnet of strawberries. And these are the sort of things we need to keep, keep, keep challenging ourselves as to why and how we can actually turn all these waste streams into big money. And I, I'd love you all to come and have a look at all the waste streams we're working with on the farm. I haven't got time to talk about them all now, but it's something we certainly, one of our favorite things is all the waste from the shop we put into our wormery. We then take the worm cast out and sell it back to the people that made the waste in the first place. I love it. It's great when they're walking out with a bag of vermicompost and thinking they're saving the planet. And you think, yeah. You pay for that twice. <laughs> appreciation, over appreciation over depreciation. Mainly, let's con concentrate on animals, but that's soil as well. And soil is easy to appreciate because the less you do to it, funny enough, the more it returns. So in actual fact, less is more. And it's often the case in this whole region sphere that less is more. So we do an awful lot of uh, appreciating things with livestock, with machinery, we we work on the we work on the on the idea that everybody seems to be addicted to power and paint, as I call it, brand new tractors with with all nice smelly paint. Well, if that's what your addiction is, then why don't you come and do my work for me? So we get contractors to come and do everything, and funny enough, there's no shortage of contractors. And how somebody can come and come and do all my haymaking for the price he charges me, I I, I have no idea, but that's not my problem. Reinvestment is a big thing. We made a bit of money out of that shop. We made about 15,000 in the first year and 25,000 in the second. It goes in a separate bank account. And funny enough, all of a sudden, we can then go and build a bigger shop or a kefir water or, or a brewery. And funny enough, then they make a load of money. And funny enough, they become rather quite um, important. That bank account seems to grow a little bit faster than every other bank account, purely because Helen has the purse strings of that bank account, not me. So that's really important. But I want to get on to um, the next little bit. Collaborations. We couldn't employ anybody. We need people on the farm. I need to talk to people. I, w I like hearing families. I like to think we're doing things. So what on earth could we do? So we came up with a bit of a different solution in actual fact of um, copying Tim May's little uh, pitch up. It was something um, he was talking about that we were already doing, but we hadn't called it pitch up, but it's a great idea. So essentially, we provide business opportunities. And we're almost calling it the farmer's dragon's den. So if we can provide a premises for a small business, you pitch up, you give us, as a member of the public or something, your idea, how it fits. We, we have premises. 
rather than me just rent your premises, I want to be part of your business. So essentially what happens, we provide a small premises or large premises, depending on what, what, what it is. That's owned by me. They move the business in. I become a 30% owner of that business. Funny enough, it's quite nice to see when more and more vans are turning up delivering kefir water because he's doing really well. And funny enough, it's getting better. And before long, he's going to have to move out. But I still own 30% of his business. It's wonderful to actually see people thriving as their own managers, their own owners, their business managers. It's their business. And it's nice for them to have a bit of support from me. And it's lovely on a, on a Friday evening, wherever we possibly can, it's actually just the brewery, the fermentary, the guys that help us with the livestock. There's about 17 businesses we're now running off the farm. We all try and have a Friday afternoon where, in actual fact, we, we taste the brewery, um, the produce. Uh, but it's really nice. And all of a sudden, there's laughter back on the farm. There's young children on the farm. And all those sort of things that I think are so important for mental health. Um, and it's helping people get a, get a foothold in business, and it's helping us financially. So that's pretty much what I was explaining there in the smallest of small writings. I'm just going to do a, um, a very short thing about my wife, because Helen is um, just amazing. Um, and I don't tell her often enough, and um, she unfortunately never gets to come uh, to any of these talks I do around the world or anywhere. Um, and I don't often talk about it that much, but a few people have just recently have made me realize um, it, it, it's, it's the support network, the closest support network is the most important part. Helen is, um, is my real soulmate. Um, and um, I, I'm just going to show you a few things about what she does. Okay. Um, first and foremost, she bought into my dream. When I came back on my Nuffield and I said, listen, we, we, we need to change everything about what we're doing for farming. She didn't just say, I think you're mad, I think you're wacky. She just said, this is an awesome idea, let's, let's go for it, and whatever we can do, we'll do it together. Her work ethic is frightening. It doesn't matter whether it's pouring with rain, whether it's beating hot sunshine. She is unbelievable in, in the amount of work she pours through in a day and I'm in, uh, absolutely in awe of what she gets done. And um, our farm is, is just incredible because of the work she puts in. But I think women in agriculture offer a massive, massive benefit to farms, especially in the livestock sector. They have a way with livestock that I don't see any man doing. Their compassion, their patience, their understanding. They have a connection with animals that I can't get beyond. And this is why I think it's so important that we have the diversity of people in our, in our farm businesses. I have never seen women work with animals in, in such an amazing way. And I always think they just have that intuitive feeling, whether it's a motherhood thing, I don't know. But they can, they can detect problems way before I think they all look fine. She's like, no, we've got a problem over there. There's something happening. I can't see it. And I just think this is where diversity of people is really important. Her work ethic and, 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 and the way she, she copes as well. We have a disabled son, as I told you. Um, but she just, it just keeps involving them in everything we're doing. And it's, I, I, can't, I can't help but be more than proud of everything she's um, achieved for, for me as a person and the reason I'm stood here. Um, and I just wish one day, hopefully, um, she'll actually come on our podcast and just talk about what she does. Um, but she's, yeah. And like I said... I think one of the most important things for anybody is the fact she stood by me when I was really quite horrible. And now we're actually enjoying the fruits of everything we're doing. So for me, Hells, you're awesome. But going back to what we're doing, a lot of people on this whole journey are like, you know, you know it's all very good. You're doing the nature thing. You're doing all that sort of thing. But, you know, I don't believe most of it. I think it's all a load of rubbish. We work with some universities, and we were sent this the other day. Um, and I think it's quite important because, in actual fact, this backs up. And once you get some proof of what you're doing is working scientifically, you know you're on the right track.
it's great when you see these sort of things. You know, it really does work. It really does regenerate your farm, really re regenerates you as a person because that b builds more confidence to do more. For those that have read Nicole Master's book, For the Love of Soil, and for those that haven't, I suggest you have a look at the word Aikigi, which is your reason for being. And I think it's probably one of the most amazing terms and explanations of exactly what regenerative agriculture could be for the likes of us and everybody stood here. And I think we should actually look at that and find our absolute reason for being. There, I am smiling, look. <laughs> oh, dear. I tell you what, to look at myself smiling and not be embarrassed and not be absolutely, you know, I am, it, it, it's, a, it's a huge thing for me. So, you know, it, it, I, I'm, just, I'm just absolutely thrilled. And what I would say is, yeah, regenerate your mind, your soil, your whole life, your farm, the environment, the community. But more importantly, this is the latest portrait we have. Um, so we've had a few family portraits done. And um, we're all stood in lines and stuff like that. And I, and I said to the photographer, I'm, so, I'm really sorry, but I don't particularly like any of the photos you've ever taken of us. Um, and he's like, what do you mean? Um, and I said, it, 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 I look at them and I don't identify with that being us. He said, so what, what do you want me to do? And I said, well, just work on the word chaos. I said, I never wear anything but shorts, so why on earth am I dressed in tweed and a tweed hat and leaning on a stick and looking like I'm from the 17th century when in actual fact I'm still here talking to you in a pair of trainers and, uh, and a, and a T-shirt. I was like, you know, I want you to capture what we are. I said, Job is the, is the head of the family and Job leads the animals. And this is what he created for us as a family portrait. We've had it done and it's four and a half meters wide and two meters high in our, uh, in our kitchen. And I walk in every day and I look at that and I think that's us. Without further ado, I'd really like to thank you for, for listening to, to, to me. Do ask any questions. I'd love to see you come and uh, have a visit around the farm. We've got five minutes for, for any questions. Um, so uh, yeah, thanks very much. I just wanted to ask if there's any support groups for farmers for mental health, like other communities or any apps or anything like that, uh, forums that you can go to to speak to people that are going through the same thing. Uh, yeah, I think I'll demonstrate. Let me see if I can just pull the slide up because I, I identify... Um, mind, mind your head. Which is a isn't that the yellow? Yeah, uh, somebody will know this better than me. Yellow Yellow Well is uh, a, a fantastic charity. Of course, we've got the RABI doing some great work. Um, I don't. Is it? Is there any stands here at Groundswell? Hi. Yeah, we provide um, completely free mental health counselling to anyone within the farming community. Uh, we launched it in January. It's been a great success. That's terrifying in the sense that uh, we had an immediate response to it. Um, but it's great that people are accessing it. So we would really, really like to spread the word that that is available. It is, as I said, it's completely free through our helpline, which is 24-7. Um, but we also have a whole range of other um, support available. There are some fantastic charities out there also. We all work together, so the important thing is if anybody makes a call or also makes a referral, um, we make sure that we build that support around the individual. Thanks. RABI. Uh, RABI. Royal, Royal Agricultural Vanilla. I can't, yeah, I can't speak. I'm so oh, yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm, I'm still amazed. I'm stood up. <laughs> yeah, question. <laughs> up, up there, sorry. Hello. Uh, firstly, thank you, Ben, for that such an amazing, inspiring and open talk to you. Um, 
been on a similar journey myself. And one thing that I'm aware of when thinking about uh, regenerative farming and moving to that is um, I'm just a possible sense of sort of uh, shame and guilt of the system that we've taken up in the past um, without necessarily the knowledge that we've got now. I just wonder whether that's something that you've encountered and also, um, you know, how, how not to let it become an issue. Yeah, massively. I mean, it's very easy for me to stand here and blame everything on my father or grandfather. But in actual fact, they were, they were doing what they thought was right. And as an agronomist for 20 years, you know, I was doing everything I firmly believed was right in, in terms of helping farmers make more and more yield, uh, protecting their crops and that sort of thing. And I think that the, the whole guilt, I was riddled with far more guilt about my son, to be honest. So, I, I mean, that was just minor guilt. Um, but I, we do encounter people. But for me, it's like, in actual fact, as Jake Fiennes is talking about, in his great book, you know, Land Healers. In actual fact, you know, we tur should turn that into a positive. In actual fact, what we've, what we've taken on, for goodness sake, what I took on for my, for my parents, I've got no blame they were trying to make a living. But what I want to leave for my children is something in a far better state. It's a very hard thing at the moment for me and, my, me and Helen to actually leave our ch children. I don't want to leave them money. I don't want to leave them... Um, um, I, I want to leave them an opportunity because I firmly believe, in actual fact, if you hand everything to them on a, on a, on a plate, I think the old saying is, isn't it, first generation makes it, second generation builds it, third generation spends it. Uh, we don't want to be that. We want to be people that actually um, you know, give opportunities to people. I want to give my daughters and son, um, Job, um, I should have brought him along, to be honest. He's awesome. Um, I want to give them the opportunity that actually th there's some soil that's not rock. You know, and it's salt, so it's living. So in actual fact, you can do anything with it. And I think that's the, the, the really important thing for me. I didn't talk that much about our 30-year plan, but we have a 30-year plan of how to actually turn our whole farm and turn it right back on its head. There is a mic. Oh, hang on. Hey, I just wanted to know a little bit more about your Dragon's Den scenario and how you kind of found those businesses and how it works and the sort of benefits and also do you live on the farm and does that sort of in um you know uh do they kind of interrupt your daily life sort of thing or anything okay um i meant to live on the farm um i generally leave about 4 a.m most mornings we get home late at night but uh, yes my house is on the farm um we found these guys so the very first one was actually funny enough in a pub um, and, and uh, got talking, and he was like, you know, um, have you got a barn to rent? And, I, and I'm, we had a barn that was rented to some lads, and, and they just used to wind me up because, actually, I knew I was going to get that much rent every month, and they'd come in with their vans and couldn't care less about dust and, you know, um, driving slowly or anything like that. It was them and us. So I told them that the problem I had with rental, and, and I said, well, why, why don't we actually... Um, and I said... In actual fact, you know, how about this for an idea? And, and they thought it was absolutely fantastic to buy into the story of the farm. So our brewery, for instance, we grow the barley and we're going to grow hops for them next year. The barley, funny enough, um, goes through their brewery and then comes out and then we get it for free to give to the pigs. So we're now feeding our pigs for free. It's pretty awesome. Um, and then what we did is a Facebook community page. Um, so anybody local um, in, in um, pitch up with your ideas. We're just at the moment just sorting some market gardeners to come and, and, and come and do that. And, and people can't believe you think you're, they, they, they think it's, it's um, you're being like over generous almost. You know, oh, well, you, you can't do all that for us. I'm like, no, no, I give you the opportunity and then, and then you'll see how it goes. So in actual fact, it's making people believe a little bit as well. Will? What, what, Hello. Hiya. Hiya. Um, so I'm a farmer. Um, I'm also LGBT plus. Um, I really like what you've been saying about, you know, having diversity, things like that. Have you got anything in particular that you think you can expand how diversity can be? Not just like queer people, people of color, people with disabilities, all this kind of stuff. I'd like to hear about that. 100%. We've got to be a little bit careful of not being um, discriminatory positive and, and actually targeting it just so happens I've got a, a gay couple that are running the fermentary. And they are the funniest pack of lads I've ever met. And we have such a laugh. They are absolutely brilliant. Um, and my whole thing, and I'll be, I'll be, I'll be fairly honest, as a, a middle-aged white male going into Birmingham Children's Hospital with a son, 
was was one of those things when the when the Sikh and the Muslim um, consultants came up to me, who were actually going to save my son's life. In the famous words of um, Derek Trotter, I couldn't care less if they were trained chimps. If that's what they were going to do, that was awesome. And as far as I was concerned, every single prejudice I might have ever had or every single thing I'd ever been taught, or more the fact that that lack of exposure because of, I lived in, in ross on Wye, which is very, you know, disappeared immediately. And they were my best friends for the rest of my life as far as I was concerned. And then I challenged, so interesting enough, in America, one of the things I ask a lot of people is, you talk so much about diversity, so where are all the blacks and the, where, where, where's anybody with color? Where are anybody with anything different? If diversity, and we talk about diversity and really mean it, for me, it means diversity of people, diversity of everything, in fully embrace. And in actual fact, I think everybody's got a load to offer. So for me, I think it's absolutely essential to, to embrace all diversity. Thank you. Um, hi, Ben. Um, you talked about your 30-year plan, and obviously throughout your talk, you've talked a lot about your, your family and, and bringing them in. Have you got um, a sort of retirement plan? Because I've had a couple of um, discussions over the last few days with people having various succession issues, um, and that it's that is a big contributing factor to mental health problems in the industry, I would say. So how, how do you... Because I, I know you, and I've been with you when people have suggested something to you. You can literally see your brain moving at a million miles an hour. You sleep about two hours a night. How are you ever going to step back from that and, and, and allow the kids to, to have their go? Yeah, I, I can't wait. I literally can't wait. And I think, I think one of the trickiest things is, for me, is not letting go. But for me, is not pressurizing my daughters or, 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 or whoever into farming. I want them to have that choice. But if, as far as I'm concerned as well, the, the most dynamic people are 20 to 30. That's when, if they want, if, if Tegan or Erin comes to me with, with an idea and want to run with it at age 21, they can have a lot. And I will do everything I can to support in everything they want to do. I won't interfere. I think it would be awesome to back you know, and, and we can't criticise our parents for not handing the farms over quick enough if we're not willing to make that change. And I think, find it really, really strange in so much of we have a generation now that are struggling. Yet in actual fact, most of them took the farm on from their parents aged about 21. So in actual, what on earth has happened? You know, my, um, I, we have a few problems. My mum lives in that massive farmhouse and I can't get her out. Um, you know, so we actually live in a three-bedroom, three, three bedroom, yeah, um, so we have we have a few, you know, but but my my daughter will end or my daughters will end up moving straight across the farm as miss a generation. I, f I find that real 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 shame actually. Um, but my mum, you know, and I think the older you get, like like the successional talking, you you almost become more more closed. You don't want to talk about it because in actual fact, you're almost talking about your own death and your, your and all that. So that's why I think actually talk about it now. If if like I said, if my girls come to me. Dad, I want to run the livestock. I want to, you carry on. Brilliant. Love it. What I have done is inspired you to think there's a living to be made in farming. Wow. Hi. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so I always love hearing you speak. Uh, it's not the first time today. Um, but it intrigues me that you're talking about diversity. You're talking about inclusion of, of people as well as every other living being. But you're, um, uh, I don't know how to put this, but kind of like your inclusion of other businesses, still you're holding the trump card because you're the landowner of a lot of land. So do you ever see some sort of community ownership or community model to really share, share the land with diversity? Yeah, fa fantastic question. And only just in the last sort of 10 days, uh, in actual fact, when I when, 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 uh, just had hosted a group of Estonians on the farm, um, I firmly believe I could make a very good living on, on, on 40 hectares. So what on earth do I do with the rest? Uh, so we 180 hectares. So as far as I'm concerned, absolutely, let the community have a go, let, let in, inspire people and do that sort of thing. Yeah, I've got, I, I, I'd love to. We're going, we're going to set up some allotments on one field to allow people to come and, and, and grow their own veg and that sort of thing and become a community. I think that's really important as for, as for farming. So, yeah, no, I, I'm 100% I'm you know, trying to get away from the whole land ownership thing. We're still fighting this court case in, and 
security is quite important at the moment um, to make sure we can just get get over that and then um, who knows where we're going to go. We done?